Hey, this is Off the Cuff, and I'm Steve from TorahFamily.org. Over the years, I've heard many different debates about the New Covenant. Is it new or is it renewed? Are we in it or are we not in it? There just seems to be a lot of confusion out there regarding the New Covenant. So, I want to do my best to at least let you know where we are in our current understanding of it all today. I know there have been some who teach their view of the covenant is the right understanding and everyone else is wrong. Now, while they may be right from a certain perspective, that doesn't make everyone else wrong. I really believe there are multiple layers in understanding things like the covenants. First, we believe it's a new covenant and not a renewed covenant. Again, let me say that again. We believe it's a new covenant and not a renewed covenant. I've kind of gone back and forth on this issue myself in regard to it being new or renewed. I've looked at several different word studies and found value in them. I guess I just struggled in finding the importance of debating a word that can be new and renewed when we have different parts of the text that appears to offer the needed clarification. We're told the new covenant will be different. It won't be like the first covenant. It contains the same law, which is eternal, but it has different promises. So, if it's different, it just seems that it's not renewed as some say. If it's different, it can't be the same thing coming around a second time. Let's say I buy a used car that needs some paintwork. If I have it painted the exact same color, you could say I renewed the paint. I made it look exactly like it was in its original condition. However, if I painted it a completely different color and even put some stripes along the side of it, is the paint job renewed or is it different? It's different. Thus, it's a new paint job. It's not renewed. It's new. This is what we're told regarding the new covenant. We're told it won't be like the previous covenant. If it's not like the first covenant, then it can't be a renewed covenant. It's a new covenant because it's not like the previous one. That all being said, we understand why many refer to it as a renewed covenant just the same. As mentioned in my teaching, Before You Deny Him, the covenant Yahweh made through Moses was really him reaching out to keep his covenant with Abraham. A covenant that Yahweh made when Abraham was sleeping. So, it was really a one-sided covenant. Meaning what? Meaning that's a covenant that won't ever be broken. Yahweh won't break his covenant. Thus, that's the everlasting covenant, the eternal covenant. This covenant was renewed with Abraham's son, Isaac. Then we see it renewed with Isaac's son, Jacob. However, we never see it renewed with Jacob's 12 sons. In fact, we see a new covenant come through Moses to the descendants of Jacob. The covenant that came through Moses was to show who will walk in the faith of Abraham, to show themselves of Abraham's descendants, thus to make them of the promise given to Abraham. So walking in the Torah shows us to be a descendant of Abraham the father of the faith. This was something the Pharisees claimed, but Yeshua clarified that only those who walked in the way of Abraham would be considered the children of Abraham. Because this is so important, let's take a few moments to quickly go over it all. We see Yahweh make the promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. Verse 6 shows Abraham believed. Verse 7 shows how Yahweh brought Abraham out of the land of the Chaldeans, which was the land of Babylon. Then in verse 8, 
we see Abraham asking for a sign or some kind of confirmation. In verse 9, we then see Yahweh instruct Abraham to bring animals for a sacrifice. Verse 10 shows Abraham did so and arranged the sacrifices. Verse 11, in my opinion, shows how the enemy will always try to come in and steal the promises. Verse 12 then shows Abraham falling to sleep. In verse 13 through 16, we see Yahweh declaring what was to come. Then, verses 17 through 20, we see the covenant given to Abraham. But remember, Abraham was asleep, so it was a one-sided covenant being made. And it came about from verse 8, where Abraham asked for a sign or some kind of confirmation. But again, Abraham was asleep. All he knows was the promise given by Yahweh. It's not until chapter 17, over 13 years later, that we see Yahweh speak with Abraham again on this matter. Verses 1 and 2 shows Yahweh is going to confirm the covenant with Abraham, the very thing Abraham was looking for all those years earlier back in verse 8 of chapter 15. We see in verse 1 that Yahweh commanded Abraham to walk before him blamelessly. Chapter 26 confirms that Abraham did indeed follow Yahweh. Then, in verses 3 through 8 of chapter 17, we see Yahweh reveal and even expound on the covenant Yahweh made with him when Abraham fell asleep back in chapter 15. Then, in verses 9 and 10, Yahweh reveals the confirmation Abraham was looking for back in chapter 15. The confirmation was circumcision. So, circumcision is the sign for Abraham, the reminder that his seed, his descendants after him, would inherit the land as an everlasting covenant. This covenant was reaffirmed to Abraham's son, Isaac, then reaffirmed to Isaac's son, Jacob. The covenant that came through Moses, however, was the first covenant that came to a group of people as a whole. <laughs> Up to this point, Yahweh had only made covenants with individuals. So, the common understanding for many is that the covenant given through Moses is a renewal of the covenant given to Abraham. However, the covenant given through Abraham was where the promise came only from Yahweh. Remember, Abraham was asleep when that covenant was made. <laughs> the covenant given through Moses is one given to a people to see who will choose to walk in the faith of Abraham, thus making them a part of Abraham's promise. So, it's really not a renewal of the Abrahamic covenant. It's a covenant to see who will choose to walk like Abraham to receive the promises given to Abraham. While many see the covenant under Moses to be a renewing of the Abrahamic covenant, and we understand that perspective, please know we see it as a new covenant to see who will choose to walk after the faith of Abraham. It's a new covenant to see who will join to the faith of Abraham. It's a new covenant that can be broken by the people because the people are to make the promise to follow. According to Deuteronomy 31.16, we see the covenant made through Moses was not the everlasting covenant as given to Abraham. Yahweh knew the people would break the covenant. There was nothing wrong with the covenant given through Moses. Yahweh found fault with the people, not the covenant. But again, it shows it's not an eternal covenant. And so we see the need for the prophet like Moses to bring the new covenant. If you haven't seen our teaching before you deny him, we strongly suggest it. It will truly help in understanding this topic. 
I believe something needed in understanding the covenants is to understand how Yahweh uses metaphors. Yahweh takes metaphors seriously. Yahweh doesn't just give metaphors for fun. He doesn't waste words. Every word spoken by Yahweh is to be taken seriously. He gives metaphors because he takes them seriously. So, we should take them seriously as well, all of them. And one metaphor isn't to be taken over another metaphor. We can't accept one metaphor and ignore another as nothing. They all mean something to Yahweh. For example, was Israel literally Yahweh's firstborn son? No, but he likened them as such. So, in his eyes, they were. Just as Jacob claimed the two sons of Joseph, so Yahweh claimed Israel as his firstborn and would treat them as such. This is important to understand. Why? Because when it comes down to it, everyone is a child of Yahweh through Adam. But Yahweh declared Israel was his firstborn to Pharaoh. Why? Because of what he was going to do to all the firstborn in Egypt. He took it seriously. So Israel had to take it seriously as well. Yahweh always takes his metaphors seriously. If he considered the nation of Israel his firstborn, then all the nations would be his children. Other times, we see where Yahweh gives metaphors of his children being daughters just as much as he gives metaphors of them being his sons. Lamentations chapter 4, Ezekiel chapter 16, and especially Ezekiel 23. If you ever get the time, I encourage you to read the whole chapter of Ezekiel 23. Why is all of this important? Because Yahweh is the first high priest in the heavenly temple. Now, please consider Leviticus 21. If a priest's daughter defiles herself by becoming a prostitute, she disgraces her father. She must be burned in the fire. You see, the story of Revelation is a tale of two women, the woman who becomes the bride and the unfaithful harlot. All who are like the unfaithful harlot ends up in the lake of fire. But why? Because all nations are the children of Yahweh. <laughs> he doesn't just throw people there because he's God. He does so because he's a just God and he's not a hypocrite. He abides by his law. He does everything according to his law. Since all nations are likened as his children, and since he's the first high priest in the heavenly temple, he will abide by his law, and the daughter who became a prostitute will be burned with fire. Yahweh always abides by his law. And when he says something or someone is like this or like that, then we need to take him at his word. Consider this. Yahweh said, heaven and earth are witnesses in regards if man obeys or rebels against his Torah. Why is this important? As I mentioned in my teaching, heaven and earth testify. Heaven and earth are the two witnesses who will begin the final judgment in the end. Hailstones of fire come from heaven, and the earth will quake. The two witnesses are the first to implement the death penalty. This is in accordance to his law. Does heaven and earth have eyes to see? Of course not. But the metaphor of them being the witnesses are obvious. And again, Yahweh takes metaphors seriously. If Yahweh says you are like this or you are like that, you better know 
He's going to treat you as such. In regards to metaphors, was Yahweh really the literal husband of Israel? No, but he declared it as such. Isaiah 54, Jeremiah 31. So, he would treat them as such. Thus, the divorce given to the northern kingdom as mentioned in Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Hosea. But then Judah, the southern kingdom, ended up being worse. This is also discussed in Ezekiel 23. So, the southern kingdom was not divorced, but found to be more unfaithful than the northern kingdom. But the scriptures tell us Yahweh is a jealous God. Exodus 34, Deuteronomy 4, and Deuteronomy chapter 6. So, Yahweh, the jealous God, remained the husband to Judah, the unfaithful wife. What happens next? We see Yahweh act upon his law found in Numbers chapter 5, the law of the jealous husband. This is where the wife is to drink the cup that brings bitter sufferings. This is the cup Yeshua mentions in the garden the night before his death. But he knew this was his purpose. He knew he was giving his life for Judah, the unfaithful wife. And so we see Yeshua take the place of Judah in drinking the cup of the jealous husband. He takes it for her. If Judah is innocent, nothing would happen. However, as the prophets declared, Judah was guilty. So, three things were declared to happen. One, her people would curse and denounce her. Two, her thigh would waste away and her abdomen would swell. And what happened to Yeshua? After taking the cup, his people denounced him while on the cross. His abdomen swelled because of the kind of death he died. We know his lungs filled up with fluid as this is a known occurrence when one is crucified. Plus, when the soldier pierced him, it says blood and water came out. When the lungs filled, they would have acted in how we see what happens with water balloons. As they filled, the weight of the fluids would have pushed his lungs into his stomach, causing his abdomen to swell. And three, because his lungs were filling up, breathing kept getting harder and harder. The common understanding is when one is crucified, they have to push up with their legs to breathe. As the curse says, the thighs would waste away. Thus, Yeshua's legs gave out and he couldn't push up anymore. So, he suffocated by no longer being able to breathe. So, Yeshua took the bitter cup of suffering for Judah. In so doing, his death brought an end to the marriage covenant that kept the northern kingdom banished by way of the divorce. The northern kingdom was divorced because of adultery. She had been with another. So, the law of marriage would not allow them to come back into covenant with their first husband. But taking the shame from Judah and releasing the northern kingdom from banishment in his death, he brought an end to the first covenant made with the people and made way for the new covenant. So now all Jew and Gentile must come to Yeshua to enter into covenant. The old covenant has been nullified. Only through Yeshua can one come into covenant now. Through his death, he made it possible for both houses of Israel to be reunited. This is what Paul was discussing to the Ephesians in regards to reconciling the two in order to make them one again. To confirm this even more, consider verse 17, where it mentions those who were far away and those who were near, 
Who is Paul talking about? He's discussing the words of Ezekiel where Judah was discussing the northern kingdom as being far away. These words to the Ephesians are discussing how Yeshua came to bring his people back together as one again through the new covenant, which can only be done by nullifying the first covenant. Yeshua himself said a kingdom divided against itself couldn't stand. Under the old covenant, it was always going to be divided. Thus, the old covenant had to be done away with by dissolving it with his death. But now, the new covenant will bring both houses back together as noted in Jeremiah 31 and is also mentioned regarding the two sticks coming back together in Ezekiel 37, where the resurrection is noted with the new covenant mentioned in chapter 36. Because Yahweh takes metaphors seriously, it explains why Yeshua had to die. There was nothing in the law that could bring the northern kingdom back. There was no sacrifice to clear the divorced northern kingdom of Deuteronomy chapter 24 since they had been with another. This is why Paul said what he did to the Galatians. Galatians 2.21 I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Showing what? Yeshua's death cleared the slate for what the sacrificial system of the law couldn't provide grace for. This is also noted in Acts 13. Acts 13, 39. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. And Romans 8, 3. For what the law was powerless to do, and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man. So what could the law of Moses not justify us from? The divorce that Yahweh decreed. Once they were divorced, they could not return until the covenant was dissolved by his death. This is also discussed in our teaching, His Sacrifice. Yahweh said He was Israel's husband. A metaphor, yes, but He takes them seriously. Then He issued the divorce because of their adultery as noted earlier. In accordance with the law in Deuteronomy 24, He couldn't bring them back into covenant because they had been with another. There is no sacrifice provided in the law to allow a woman to come back into covenant with her first husband. So, while Yeshua's sacrifice did indeed atone for our sins by completely wiping them out, his sacrifice was not specifically a sin sacrifice in accordance to the law. The Passover is not a sin sacrifice it can actually be considered a replacement sacrifice. And that is what Yeshua did for us. He died in our place. So, as Paul said in Romans chapter 7, when the husband dies, the woman is released from the covenant, thus releasing the wife from the sins committed under the first covenant. Again, his sacrifice was not one that is found in the law. But his sacrifice annulled the marriage covenant, thus setting us free from the sins under that covenant. So, his sacrifice of giving his life paid for our sins. Now, just as Yeshua died and released us from that law, we are to follow his example and die to our old self, showing ourselves now to be the faithful bride walking in the Spirit and not following in the same ways as an adulterer. But how do we walk in the Spirit? By walking in accordance 
to the law. According to Romans 8, those who do not pursue the law are walking according to their sinful nature, but those who walk in the Spirit are pursuing the law. We are to count ourselves dead to sin, but alive to Yahweh through Yeshua, thus repenting and walking in His ways, putting to death our old life to walk in the newness of Him, walking in the faith of Abraham. Then, by putting our old selves to death, we will be raised to walk in our resurrected bodies, like Yeshua, at the time of the new covenant, just as it's given in Ezekiel chapters 36 and 37. But here's the thing. He came once. He died once. He's not going to die again. So, just as Hebrews chapter 10 says, if we do the same things, there is no more sacrifice left, only judgment. We will be worse off than before. If someone has known the truth and then rejects it, he is worse off. Why? Because there is no third chance. So, where are we at now in regards to the New Covenant? We are now in Ketubah, the marriage engagement, and waiting for the New Covenant, the marriage mentioned in Revelation chapter 19. As mentioned earlier, the story of Revelation is about two women, the harlot and the bride. We are now in the same situation that Mary was in with Joseph. He was going to divorce her even though they weren't officially married yet. It's because a ketubah is basically viewed in a sense that you are already married. And as Joseph was going to divorce Mary, if we are found to be unfaithful, we will be divorced. However, this time it will be forever. The unfaithful will be viewed as the harlot and thrown into the lake of fire. The faithful will enter the eternal promise given to Abraham and inherit the land. But remember, even though the first covenant has been voided, the law remains. The law is eternal. So, we show ourselves faithful during the ketubah, the engagement. We show ourselves faithful by pursuing the Torah as we wait for the new covenant, the marriage covenant. Just as Moses brought a new covenant for the purpose of bringing people in alignment with the promises given to Abraham, Yeshua brings the new covenant for the exact same purpose, to keep the covenant made with Abraham. The new covenant under Yeshua enables us to be part of those promises given to Abraham. Yeshua came to confirm the covenant given to the patriarchs. What was promised? The descendants of Abraham will get the land. Genesis 24, Genesis chapter 50, Exodus 33. We'll cover how that all comes to fruition in a moment. Yeshua's death set us free from the curse that bound us from the first covenant, the curse being disobedience to the law. But we know many try to say the new covenant Yeshua brings actually did away with the law. Well, that's simply not true. In fact, the new covenant is where the law is placed upon our hearts. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31. These verses show Yahweh will put his law in our minds and write it on our hearts. And please know, these are the same verses quoted in the New Testament when discussing the new covenant. These both show the law is placed on our hearts. Now, this is where I normally hear people say, exactly, it's on our hearts, so we don't have to do it anymore. But when the law is placed on your heart, it simply means it will come naturally to you. 
it will be all that you want to do. But it's verse 11 that really throws people for a loop. It says, no longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. What does this mean? It means we're not in the new covenant yet. People are still reaching out to their neighbor in accordance to Yeshua's words in Matthew 28. At the time of the new covenant, the law will be in all of our hearts and we will all live it flawlessly. But until that time, we pursue it the best we can to how we read and understand it individually. Some people struggle in thinking we aren't in the new covenant yet. However, we need to think of it in the light of Joseph and Mary when Mary was with child. Now, I know we discussed this some already, but I think it bears repeating and probably even a little more detail. Joseph, again, was going to divorce her before they were even married. Why the divorce if they weren't married, right? Again, this is because they were in Ketubah. A Ketubah is basically where they're engaged. However, a Ketubah is taken much more seriously. Now, that being said and understood, this is the phase we're in right now. We're waiting for the bridegroom to come and we are to be found faithful when he returns. We're in Ketubah. We don't want to be divorced. You can say we're not married yet. Neither was Joseph and Mary. We are waiting for the marriage. We are in Ketubah. In the engagement. So the new covenant begins when he comes for his bride. At the time of the resurrection. Ezekiel mentions the new covenant in Ezekiel 36. Then we see it come to fruition by way of the resurrection in Ezekiel 37. Now, there are some who will say that the bride is not the people, but rather the new Jerusalem because of what's mentioned in Revelation chapter 21. However, please remember the eternal covenant with Abraham was regarding the land and the people, as noted here in Exodus 32. Now, when we see the New Jerusalem coming down in Revelation, we must remember it's after the event that is often referred to as the Great White Throne Judgment. This is where all those who were not raised in the first resurrection will be judged. Those who were in the first resurrection will not be a part of this last judgment. They've received their judgment already. So, where will they be at this time? Those who were raised in the first resurrection will be in the new Jerusalem at this time. Showing what? The people and the city coming down together making the whole promise to Abraham finally come to fruition, as we discussed at the beginning of this teaching. In fact, that's why we see Yahweh saying it is done just as we begin to see the new Jerusalem come down. Notice how verse 7 says, He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Meaning what? He has completed his unconditional promise to Abraham. The people inherit the land. His descendants who chose to walk in his ways inherit the land. So please remember, it's not just about the land. It's about the land and the people. <laughs> the new covenant begins at the first resurrection and comes to complete fruition just after the second resurrection. 
Another element to confirm that the people are still considered his bride is found in Hosea chapter 2. Right after Yahweh declares Israel is not his wife anymore, he mentions how the time will come again that they will be by way of the new covenant. And remember, if Yahweh said it, he means it. So just as Yahweh rejected Jerusalem and its people in the past, we see the new Jerusalem and his people together in the end. Lastly, regarding the old covenant, the Antichrist will set up the ark of that covenant, but it represents the old covenant. This will be a time that deceives many. The ark of the old covenant will not be set up under Yeshua's reign. When the new covenant is in place during Yeshua's reign, the ark won't even come to mind as Jeremiah 3 says. Some may believe this is a time that is represented in the past, that being how the ark wouldn't come to people's minds. Thus, the ark will be used again when Yeshua returns. However, the ark has always come to mind for people of faith. <laughs> it's a subject that many have reflected on just as they have the exodus out of Egypt. But just as the second exodus under the new covenant will overshadow the first one out of Egypt, according to Jeremiah 16, likewise, the ark will also be forgotten by way of the new covenant under Yeshua. When Yeshua returns, the only ark that will exist will be the one in the heavenly temple. One of the distinguishing differences between the anti-Messiah and Yeshua is that the anti-Messiah will set up the ark of the old covenant. Please see our teachings, the image of the beast and the return of the tent. So while the anti-Messiah will set up the ark of the old covenant, Yeshua will get rid of it. Why? Because it represents the covenant his death did away with. When he returns, he will establish the new covenant for those who are in the first resurrection. You see, in the old covenant, the law was placed inside the ark. In the new covenant, he places the law in our hearts. Those who have the law in their hearts will be those of the first resurrection. Those who rule with him in the millennium. <laughs> but that's a different teaching. <laughs> Again, we are now in Ketubah, awaiting the new covenant. We are to be found faithful in living for him. We are to be faithful in following his ways as we long for his return. Well, that's all I have. Think about it. Pray about it. But more than anything, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Until next time, Shalom.